If you have your Bibles, hold them up. Let's pray. Father, we come holding your word high and exalting it and submitting ourselves to it. We come this morning, Lord, to hear from you from heaven. We know, Lord, that you speak to us through your holy word, and we pray today that you would open your word to us and speak. Lord, that you would show us great things from your scriptures. God, that you would open our understanding so that we can know the truth and that we can have assurance of our salvation and know that we have eternal life. Father, we praise you and we give you all of the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we're going to be in the book of 1 John. Again, that's uh, the book of 1 John, the little epistle, not the, the, the gospel, the, the long book. It's near the end of the Bible. We're going to be in 1 John chapter 1 this morning. Now, if we were to go out into our community and ask the question, what is Christianity? I think we would get a whole bunch of different responses because everyone has a different opinion on what Christianity is. Right? It, a lot of people have a lot of different answers. Some people would say that it's a place that it, it, Christianity is practiced by people who never have any fun. They're, they're just people who follow a bunch of rules and they spend their Friday nights watching the Left Behind series. If we ask the, the mainstream media, they would say that Christianity is practiced by judgmental people who belong to the Republican Party. right? And if we ask people in some other countries, many of them would say that Christianity is the religion of America. But what is Christianity? That's the question that we're going to tackle this morning. What is true Christianity? And how do we know that what we believe is true? Right? What, what makes Christianity more special or more unique than Hinduism or Islam? What, what makes what we believe the truth and everything else a lie? Because that's ultimately what we're saying, right? When we say that Christianity is true, we are saying all the other ones are not. Our text this morning is going to show us what true Christianity is all about. So if you would stand with me as we read 1 John chapter 1, we're going to read verses 1 through 4. God's Word says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and shew unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. You can be seated. So in your bulletin what I've done is I've broken this uh, passage of Scripture down into three parts. The first part is the premise of Christianity, the essence. What is Christianity? Right, we're going to define that. And then the proof of Christianity is the second part. How do we know that it's true? What sets Christianity apart from all other religions? And then the point of Christianity. Why does it matter? Why do these truths even matter? Because there are certain things that are true, but it doesn't have an impact on our spiritual life. Why do these truths matter? Now, as we get into this, we need to remember uh, some of what we talked about last week, that in the book of 1 John, uh, he is writing to a group of Christians. Now, we don't know exactly what group of Christians, right? It wasn't to a specific church in a specific place, but to many churches over uh, in a region. And he was writing this because there was some false teaching that had crept up into the church. It had come in and it had started teaching that you believe the gospel, but you need more than the gospel. That there is some other extra knowledge that you need in order to be saved. These people were starting to teach that, that if you didn't have this special secret knowledge, well then... You, you weren't really saved. They, they also taught that anything that was material, anything made of matter that was physical, was evil. And that only the spiritual things mattered. And therefore they concluded that, uh, that, that Christ, God, could not become a man. That He couldn't be a physical man because that would be evil. And so that's what they taught. And, and, um, and, and Jesus came in the flesh. This is John's point that he's going to make. And in case you think that this is irrelevant today, that this is just some old false teaching from, from way back when, 2,000 years ago, and it doesn't matter anymore, I want to bring to your attention two things. One, there is a church right down the road from here that teaches this very heresy. They're called Mormons. You see, Mormons teach that Jesus was not God in the flesh. In fact, they teach that at Jesus' baptism, the Spirit of Christ came on a man... Jesus, and he was empowered to be the Christ. And then 
at his crucifixion, that spirit left him. That's what Mormons teach. This is not just some old heresy that has no implications for us today. The second thing I want to point out to you is that this is a truth of Scripture. This is a truth that we anchor our hope in. That God became a man. That He lived in the flesh. He died and that He rose again bodily. That He truly lives. That God became a man and died for us and lives today. And what John is going to do here is he's going to show us in this book also that uh, the spiritual and the physical aren't actually disconnected. right? What we do physically is still a spiritual endeavor. The, the things that we do physically in this world actually have an effect in the spiritual realm. They're not disconnected from each other, but they're interconnected and intertwined. So let's dive into the passage. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you kind of a, uh, a summary of these four verses. <clears throat> so it says, True Christianity is Jesus Christ. That's what John is trying to tell us. That's his whole point here in these four verses. True Christianity is not an idea. It is a person. It is Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ revealed. It is Jesus Christ experienced. And it is Jesus Christ proclaimed. That is what Christianity is. And this is exactly where John goes right out of the gate. And so he doesn't write this letter like a lot of the other letters that we find in the New Testament. He doesn't address it, you know, Hi, I'm John, and I'm writing to you for this reason, and blah, 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 blah. He doesn't do that. He just jumps straight into the, the, the topic at hand, Christianity. And he points directly to Jesus. That which was from the beginning. Right? This is the premise of Christianity. That which was from the beginning. What was from the beginning? The Word of Life. The Word of Life. That is Jesus Christ. Right? We were reminded of John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, there has never been a time when the Son did not exist. When Jesus Christ did not exist. He has always existed from eternity past with God the Father. God the Son, Jesus Christ, did not become the Son when He was, uh, when he was incarnated in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He had always existed from eternity past. In verse number 2, John tells us this very thing. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father. You see, He was with the Father. He has always existed. And what John is trying to do here is remind us of this old message and remind the readers here of this old message that they had received, the gospel, that God had become a man that He had dwelt among us, and then He died on the cross in our place. And these false teachers had come in, and they had convinced some of these uh, Christians to, to not believe this. They had convinced them that they needed more than just the gospel. That they, couldn't, uh, that they, that they needed more than this old message that they had received from the apostles. That there was more to it than that. Isn't that just like the devil? To come and try and convince God's people that God's word isn't enough. That God is holding out on you. That there is some knowledge out here that he doesn't want you to have. Right? This is the same lie in the Garden of Eden that he told Adam and Eve. Right? God is holding something back from you. That's why he don't want you to eat from the tree. Right? He caused them to doubt God's word. And Satan's tricks haven't changed. He's done the same thing. Don't buy the lie, church. The Bible is sufficient. It is true and it is enough. We do not need psychology to tell us how to make our church grow or to be appealing to the world. We don't need psychology to teach us how to raise our children or fix our marriages or to find contentment. We do not need worldly philosophy to watch or to teach us to get along with the world. We don't, we don't need those things. We need God's Word. We need to read the Bible in order to live the Bible. And this false teaching that John is combating here actually sounded more like Greek philosophy than it did Christianity. And we're not beyond this today. We're not. You see, we have to draw a line in the sand. And we have to say enough with the worldly philosophy and the pagan ideologies. And we have to hold to the word of God. And we have to draw a line in the sand and stake our claim here. This is where we stand. In the word. I have nailed my flag to the mast. You heard that phrase before? You know what it means? So, <clears throat> back in the day, two ships would be at sea and they would begin to fight one another. And they would shoot uh, cannons at each other, right? When they get alongside each other. And at some point in the battle, one of the captains would realize that they're losing and that their ship is going to go down. 
And so what he would do is he would order one of his crew members to go up on the mast and nail their flag to the mast. Basically what he was saying is, those are our colors, they represent us, and we're nailing it to the mast so we can't pull it down because we go down with the ship. Church, that's what we have to do. We have to nail our flag to the mast of the Bible. That if we go down, we go down standing on the Word of God. That if we're going to be hated by the world, then so be it. But this is where we stand. That we do not compromise on the Word of God. We do not budge off of the truth of His Word, even if it makes the world hate us. No, we believe this old message. We believe the old way, and we believe the old book, which really isn't an old book. It's a timeless book. But John here, he, he anchors this in more than just words on a page. That's, that's what we have to see this morning. He anchors this in more than just words on, the ba- on, the, on a page. You see, the Bible is not just a book. It is the message of God. It is the very testimony about the creator of all things who became a man and lived and died and rose again. Now, a word, when we use words, it's an expression of an idea, right? So when, when I speak, my words are expressions of ideas and visions in my head, right? I'm trying to paint a picture for you with words. That's what we do when we talk. And this is exactly what John means when he calls Jesus the word of life. He is saying that the, the life of Jesus Christ is God speaking to the world. It was God speaking and demonstrating exactly what he wanted to say to men. You see, this means that God has given us more than just written words on a page. The Bible is more than just written words. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is, He has given us His Son. And this book is enough. This book shows us the Savior. And we have here the testimony of these eyewitnesses of the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. And this is exactly where John goes with it. <clears throat> he says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard. Which we have heard. Right? The, the idea here is not just that he heard something off in the distance. Some, um, you know, something unclear. No, no, no. This word means clarity. It means something that was heard and clearly understood. The message that the apostles preached and wrote that we now call the New Testament, it's not some faint echo or unfamiliar voice. It was not some random collection of thoughts or hard sayings or riddles that were compiled together. It's the clear message that was totally understood that came from the very lips of God. It came from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And John is saying, we have heard him. And then he goes on and he says, which we have seen, which we have seen with our eyes. This isn't just some vague thing, some shadowy figure in the, in the, in the clouds. John says, we have seen him. And this word means to discern, to see it and understand it, to clearly see the outline and define it clearly, totally, full picture. And just in case case he wasn't clear enough with that, he adds, with our eyes. We have seen him clearly with our eyes because he is physical. It was real. It was not a dream. It was not a vision. It was not a hallucination. He saw Jesus with his own eyes. And then he adds, which we have looked upon. We've looked upon him. Now, he's not just saying the same thing twice here. He's actually saying something slightly different. He is saying, we have examined him. We have thoroughly inspected him. We have looked at him closely. It's like when you go to the supermarket and you're buying some fruit and you go down the aisle, you don't just go by and not really look, just kind of glance at the fruit. What he's talking about is, is when you're ready to buy that fruit, you go over there and you pick it up and you look at it. You inspect it to make sure there's no bruises on it, to make sure there's no mold on it, right? You, You look at it intently. You behold that fruit. That's what he's saying. We have looked at him up close and acquainted with him. The apostles studied him. And then he even adds, and our hands have handled. He not only heard the teaching of Jesus clearly, he not only saw Jesus clearly and examined him and followed him, he touched him. He he felt Christ physically. Do you remember at the Last Supper when the disciples are lounging uh, around the table there? Do you remember that one of the disciples was leaning up against Jesus? Do you remember which one that was? It was John. It was John. He had felt him. 
He felt it. And John is reminding these believers of that message, of the apostles, that they saw Jesus, that they heard Him, that they felt Him, both before He was crucified and after He was crucified, and after He rose from the dead. He says, of the word of life. He he gives this title to Jesus, and this is a unique title that is given to Jesus here. um, It's a combination of two ideas that are found in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 1, we read verse 1 a minute ago. Here's that whole passage. He says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And so John here combines these two terms. In the beginning was the Word, and this Word was in Him was the life. And so we have the Word of life. John is trying to drive home one great truth that we cannot miss. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. It was Jesus that was there from the beginning. And He is called the Word of life, which is a direct reference to Christ as the Creator and the Giver of life. That is a title that only God can have. But John here, get this, there's a difference. He is not claiming that a man became God. He's saying God became a man. You see, there's a distinction that we need to make there because man cannot become God. We can never ascend to Godhood, right? This is what the Eastern religions and all of these things teach, right? That that if you're reincarnated enough and you have enough karma, that eventually you'll ascend into part of the divine. That is not what John is saying. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He is God made man. You see, God looked down and He knew that man can never be anything more than sinners. That we were lost. And so God had to take it into His own hands and He became a man. God became a man because man can never be God. The Son of God incarnated. God did this so that He could die for us. Because that is the only way to save a sinful people like us. There is no other way. And there is no way that we could ever ascend to anything even close to God. So God became a man. But get this truth. This is an amazing truth. Jesus is still a man. He's still a man. Did you know that? The Bible says, there is one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. Jesus, in his resurrected body, has ascended into heaven at the right hand of the Father right now where he stands as our priest interceding for us. But he's still a man. The second person of the Trinity, God the Son, has become a man, and not just for 33 years, but for the rest of eternity. He took on human flesh when he was conceived inside the womb of the Virgin Mary, and he took on that human flesh for all of eternity. And do you know why he did that? He did that so he could die for you. He did that so he could die for me so that he could be our priest in heaven, so that he could rule as the king of all of humanity. What a wonderful Savior. What a great, deep, unfathomable love. Our God has become a man so that man can be brought back to God, so that we could be with him. So if you're taking notes, this is the first thing. Because Jesus is God in the flesh, we must live in obedience to him. Because Jesus is God in the flesh, we must live in obedience to Him. Because of who He is, because He is God, because He truly lives, we must obey Him. If if this man, Jesus Christ, is truly God in the flesh, that makes Him Lord. That makes Him the one we owe our lives to. This claim that that, that God has become a man is is what angers a lot of people, right? It, It ruffles feathers. It's okay to say that Jesus healed people. It's okay to say that Jesus was a good teacher, but when you start saying that he was God, that's when people get upset. This has been an attack on Christianity throughout church history, the deity of Christ. You see, the world doesn't mind when we talk about those other things. It's when we claim that Jesus is God that we have a problem. Because now we're saying that this particular Jewish man has authority over everyone's lives. And that the account that was written about him and the things explaining him, written in a certain book, that certain book now has authority over their lives. That's why people have a problem with it. Because we can no longer live the way we want to live because the God-man has come. And the God-man has showed us the right way. And he's shown us what is real and true. 
And He has shown us that we are sinful and that we must trust Him in order to be saved from certain judgment. And the world hears this claim of Jesus. They hear that claim and they scoff and they mock and they say to Him, Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? God. That's who He is. God in the flesh. He is exalted Lord and King. And so John here makes the claim that God, the source of life, has become a man. But that doesn't necessarily make it true, right? Anybody can claim to be God. Anybody can claim, can, can stake a claim and say, hey, I'm God. So the next part is the proof of Christianity. Look at verse 2. Here's the proof of Christianity. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it. Now, obviously here he, he is talking about Jesus coming into the world. But he's more specifically talking about the claim of seeing Jesus Christ risen after he died. Right? This is the one thing that proves that Jesus is who he says he is. The resurrection. The resurrection. Christianity stands or dies based on the resurrection. If you want to end Christianity, you want to disprove Christianity, it's simple. Disprove the resurrection. But you can't do that. This is what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 15. He says this, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be the dead do not rise. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. Christianity stands or falls on the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ rose bodily. If He did not, we are still in our sins. We have no hope. Our hope is anchored in the fact that Jesus lives. We have the record of the eyewitnesses. John says, we have seen it and we bear witness to it. The apostles had seen Him, they had touched Him, they had talked to Him, both before and after His resurrection. Right, we read it earlier in Luke 24. Here's a portion of that again. He said unto them, Jesus said unto them, this is after His resurrection, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see, as you see me have. Jesus said, touch me, feel me, hear me. I am real. I am alive, bodily resurrected. Now there's a, <clears throat> there's a lot of attacks that come against the resurrection because like I said, if you can disprove the resurrection, you end Christianity. And so people come and they try to come up with all of these different things to disprove, uh, to disprove the resurrection. And I'm going to give you those and, uh, so that we can understand what these people are saying and you can see how false they are. So, First, people say, maybe the disciples stole the body of Jesus, right? The disciples decided that they were going to steal the body and then claim that Jesus rose from the dead. So, how ridiculous this is. These 11, this 11 men, this band of misfit fishermen and tax collectors, decided, after running away when Jesus was arrested just a couple days before, <clears throat> decided that they were going to go and overpower trained Roman soldiers. And then they were going to move the big heavy stone that had a Roman seal on it, which was basically a lock. They were going to move this big stone and steal the body. Now, if that isn't ridiculous enough, think about this. When those men later on were arrested for preaching the message that Jesus lives, that was why they were arrested. They were tortured and they were killed for that message. Do you really think that, a, that men who made up a lie would die for something they knew wasn't true? And we're not talking about just dying. These men died in gruesome ways. They were tortured. They were sawn in half. They were drugged to death by horses. They were fed to, wild li uh, to hungry lions. They were crucified upside down. You don't die for something you know isn't true. And they were dying for making the claim that they had seen Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Simply save your life. All you have to do is retract a statement. No man's going to die for something he knows a lie. Some people say, well, maybe they thought it was real. And they were just hallucinating, right? They thought they had seen him, but they really didn't. Well, the problem with that is, is in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, Paul says this, After that, after the resurrection, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. What, what is Paul saying? Well, he's saying that there were over 500 people that seen Jesus at one time, risen from the dead. And when Paul wrote that, 
to the Corinthian church, he says most of these people are still alive. That means you can go and verify the validity of this statement, that Jesus rose from the dead and men have seen it. Not just 11 men, over 500 men have seen him. This is not a hallucination. Well, people say, well, maybe, maybe the Romans took the body. Or, or the religious leaders took the body. <clears throat> but that doesn't make any sense. Because as soon as Christianity started to get out of their control, what would they do? Go get the body and present it to the world and say, look, he's really dead. He's right here. Some, like the Muslims, claim it wasn't actually Jesus on the cross. It was just a lookalike. It was a stunt double, right? But that can't be right because, one, Mary was there, and I think she would recognize her own son. And number two, the religious leaders hated Jesus. They wanted him dead. They were the ones that incited the crowd to crucify him. I think they would make sure they had the right guy. They knew what he looked like because they arrested him. Judas had betrayed him. Some say he wasn't actually dead. Right? The Romans, in their rush to get the bodies off the cross, actually Jesus wasn't actually dead. They took him off too soon. And so he was put in the grave, but he was still alive. Well, here's the, the, the ridiculousness of that statement. Number one, he was beaten half to death. And so for him to get out of the tomb would mean that he would have to move that big heavy stone by himself that had a Roman seal, which was like a lock on it. Also, the wounds themselves, by themselves, the, the scorching that Jesus took would have been enough to kill him from infection and from loss of blood. And so that is absolutely ridiculous. Plus, the Romans were skilled in killing. They crucified hundreds of people a year. They knew when someone was dead. We are left with only one plausible true scenario. Jesus Christ, who was an actual man in history, in historical fact, was crucified and buried in a borrowed tomb. His followers claim that he rose from the dead and the tomb was empty. That is all historical fact. No one can present the body because Jesus lives. Because Jesus is alive. That is the truth. And he could only do this because he was who he claimed to be. He was God. He was the possessor of life. He was the king of the universe, and he still is. You say, well, where does faith come in on this then? Right? I mean, if it's a, if it's a fact, if it's a historical fact, where does faith come in? If it's such an obvious truth, how come all of the people back then didn't believe it? How come everyone didn't believe in Jesus? How come it was only some? Because Jesus didn't show himself to everyone. Because Jesus didn't reveal himself to everybody. He only revealed himself to a select few. And then he told them to go give the testimony. And they wrote it down for us. And we have that testimony. It's called the New Testament. You see, God wants us to believe in the word of the testimony of the Word of God. He wants us to trust by faith. What is, what is, uh, do you remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man and Lazarus. If you remember the story, the, 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 <clears throat> the Lazarus was a poor beggar and he lived outside the house of the, of the rich man who stepped by him every day and never helped him, never offered him any aid. And then they both die. And the rich man goes to hell and Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom, which was paradise, which is where they went before Jesus died. <clears throat> And there was a chasm fix, so they couldn't get to each other, but they were talking to each other. And the rich man asked and said, Abraham, send Lazarus back to my brethren. Send him back and tell him to warn them of his place so they don't come here. And what did Abraham say? He said, they have Moses and the prophets. They have the word of God. Let them hear them. Let them listen to what the word of God says. And he says, no, 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 no. If one rises from the dead, they'll hear him. And Abraham says, no, no, no. If they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they listen, though one rise from the dead. You see, God has made it a matter of faith in His Word. The written record of those eyewitnesses, we must believe the testimony of Scripture. It is the written record of those eyewitnesses. We have four accounts of the life of Christ in the Gospel. We have the account of the work of the promised Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. We have 21 letters written by men explaining Christ who's seen Him risen from the dead. And we have the book of Revelation that shows Christ triumphant in the heavens. And then, not to mention, we have the Old Testament. The whole Old Testament with its 39 books and all of its prophecy and all of its things written for us, proving that Jesus is the Messiah, that He is the Christ. It's, 
in these words that are written that we can know Him. In prayer and in the ministry of the Holy Spirit, through the Word, we can actually have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is why John says, and I show it unto you, that eternal life, and I show unto you that eternal life. John is saying that we can know the eternal life, which is Jesus Christ Himself. John is saying you can know that He is real and that He truly lives because of all of the testimony that is given. He says, I want to introduce you to him. That's why he wrote his gospel, right? John says in John chapter 20, in the gospel of John, I have written this so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He is calling on us to know him by faith, to trust in the word and to go to him in prayer because he is alive and you can know him. He is God in the flesh who died for us and rose from the dead. And if he rose from the dead, the claims that he makes are true. That means that he can keep his promises. We can bank on them, that he will keep them. That's the second thing if you're taking notes. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we can trust that he will give us eternal life like he promised. Because he rose, we can trust that he'll give us eternal life just like he promised he would. You see, he is now the one in control of life and death because he has defeated death. And he promises that by faith, if we believe in him, if we trust him, that he will give us eternal life. It's a promise. Church, we can be assured of that promise. John says that we can know that we have eternal life. How? Because Jesus is alive. He's not a spirit. He's not some story. He's not a hallucination. He is a real man who really lived and really died and really rose from the dead and really lives today. And John, the apostle, and the other apostles, they saw him. They touched him. They heard him. And then they wrote to us explaining what they had seen and heard and touched. Explaining him to us. Why? Why did they do that? It wasn't just to fill our heads with facts about this person, Jesus, that they had seen and touched. There's a reason for it. Look at verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. Okay, so he's given us the message. That ye also may have fellowship with us. And so the third part of our outline is the point of Christianity, the point of Christianity, the objective of Christianity, and that is fellowship. Fellowship is the point here. John tells us that these these truths, we need to believe them so that we can have fellowship with him and the other apostles. Now, I want you to know that fellowship is more than just a meal together, right? Now, I know that goes against Baptist doctrine, but fellowship is more than a meal. Fellowship is working together for a goal, right? It's fellows in a ship rowing towards one purpose, working together in harmony towards a goal. When we become Christian, we believe in Jesus. We become a part of the family of faith. We now have more in common with a Chinese Christian or an African believer than we do with our neighbor that doesn't believe in Christ. Because we have come to Christ and because we hold to the word of life. John is saying that we must believe in Christ. We must hold to the doctrine of the apostles and we must work towards that. And you say, well, hey, that's great, right? That's great. But my question is, John, why would I want to have fellowship with you? Right? I mean, this is, this is a band of fishermen and tax collectors, a persecuted, beaten-up band of misfits, people who are hated everywhere they go. Why would I want to have fellowship with you? Because of the next part. He says, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with His Son, Jesus Christ. That's why we want to have fellowship with them. Because through that, we can have fellowship with the Father. Because by believing the word of their testimony, we can have fellowship with God. We can walk with God. We can know Him. Now, there's actually a warning in this if you keep reading. John is going to say that if we think we have fellowship with Him, but we still live in darkness, we're we're not actually walking with God. We don't actually know Him. That's what we're going to look at next week. It's actually the first test of a true salvation. But we need to know that Jesus came and lived and died and rose from the dead. That's what John is trying to drive home to us here. We need to know this because that's how we walk with God, is through faith in Jesus. So that we can walk with Him, so that we can know Him. and So that we can have fellowship and join in the mission given to the apostles and we can tell others about Christ. And so the last thing, if you're taking notes, is this. Because Jesus lives... We should know Him and make Him known. We are to work towards the same 
goal. What was the goal? Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That's the mission. And we are to join in on that mission. That's the fellowship we're to have with them. Because we know Christ. Because Jesus lives. We have the greatest story that could ever be told. We can't keep it to ourselves. We must go out with joy and assurance and hope and proclaim the gospel, the good news, that Jesus lives. And John and the other New Testament writers write to us so that we can also have joy. Look at verse 4. He says, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Who is we? The apostles. The other apostles. He's, He's not just talking about this one letter. He's talking about the entire testimony of the New Testament. The gospels, Acts, Paul's writings, Peter, James, Jude. He's talking about the writings of the New Testament. Now, hear me on this. It is not the experience of seeing and hearing and touching Jesus that John tells us will give us joy. You understand that? He's not saying, I'm I'm writing this to you so that you too can see and hear and touch Jesus. One day we will in heaven, right? We're going to see him, we're going to touch him, we're going to hear him. That's not where we find joy. He's saying we can have the same joy as the apostles right now without seeing him and hearing him and touching him because of what is written. He has written it to us. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full, that it may be complete. John is saying we wrote the New Testament work so that you could have the joy and assurance like we do. See, don't fall into the trap of thinking that it was easier for the disciples and and the first century believers to, to follow Christianity because they had seen Jesus and because they had seen miracles. It wasn't. That's not true. Listen to what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse uh, 16 through 19. Peter says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So, so Peter says, We have not followed these made up stories. Right? These, these aren't fables, these aren't just myths. We are eyewitnesses to this. We've seen it. But he goes on, he says, For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mountain. Now what Peter's talking about here is the Mount of Transfiguration. That you remember uh, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up to the mountain and Jesus was transformed before them in dazzling white. They could barely look at him. And Moses and Elijah met him there on the mountain. And then a voice came from heaven and said, this is my well-beloved Son, right? Now what Peter is saying is, is we, we were there. I was there. I saw this. I saw His majesty. I saw this great vision. This, this wasn't really a vision. It was a revelation. I, I saw His majesty right here before me. But listen to what he says next. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well to take heed. What is he talking about? What is a more sure word of prophecy? The word of God. Peter is saying, that the written Word of God is more sure than just a one-time exposure to the revelation of Jesus Christ. Seeing Jesus in all of His glory one time in my life, and then going the rest of my life with no other revelation other than that one sighting, that one time, is not better than having the whole written account of the Word of God. We have the complete Word of God. The Holy Scriptures. Church, we have more sure word of promise than some vision, than just a one-time revelation. We have the written word about God, about His Son, and we can trust this book. And it proclaims to us that Jesus is alive, that He is God in the flesh. He died for us, and that He has risen again. Christianity is not some mystical, subjective idea. Christianity is the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's what Christianity is. It is all about Jesus, and He lives. It is truth about a real person who died and who rose from the dead. And you can know Him. We can have fellowship with Him. That's why He died. That's why John is writing this. That's why the the apostles wrote the New Testament, was so that we can have fellowship with them, with the Father. You can know Him. So let me ask you this question. Do you have doubts about whether or not you're saved? You need to get in the Word. You need to get in the Bible and you need to pray. I think the biggest mistake that many of us make is that we seek God in everywhere everywhere except where He has revealed Himself. 
He has revealed himself to us in the pages of the Bible. And so if we want to know God, if we want to know his son, Jesus Christ, we go to the word. If you want God to work in your life, you want to see the power of God working in your family and changing people and changing you and changing your children and your wife, then you need to get in the word because that's where the power is. We need to trust his word. So the question is, is do you believe in Jesus? Do you know him? Do you have fellowship with him? There's an invitation this morning to know him. You can know him. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. We give you glory that you have given us your written word, the truth that we can know you, that you sent your son, God in the flesh, to die on the cross for us and rise from the dead so that we can know you. I pray, Father, for anyone in here who is uh, doubting their salvation. I pray, Father, that Maybe they have their eyes on themselves. They say, they say, you know, I know that the, the, I believe the resurrection is real, and I believe that the Bible is true, and I believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, and all of those things, but I'm just not sure if I'm saved. Father, help them to set their eyes back on Jesus and not on themselves. If we look at ourselves, we'll never, ever think that we could be saved, but when we look to Jesus, I don't know how anyone could not be. Father, I pray that you would help us, that you would open our eyes to the truth, that you would give us a passion for your word, that we would go back to your word and study it and read it and learn it so that we can know you, so that we can fellowship with you, so that we can proclaim your truth, your gospel to the world. Help us, Father. We praise you in Jesus' name.